College one is uh, no personal attack, and the other one is one fool at a time. Oh, All right. And the College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we will have speakers who, and right, first will be a brief announcements period, then our speakers will speak up to an hour thereabouts. Then we have our question and answer period. And then at the end, we have our infamous rebuttal period where you can speak on or off topic and uh, sound off. I do know we have a speaker tonight, a couple of them. Justin Tucker, chair of the Libertarian Party of Chicago, and David Travis, college regular and long-term LP activist. Anne Rand is the best known as the author of such novels as Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead. Her work stressed the primacy of the individual and the evils of collectivism. She was also known, she was also the founder of the philosophy objective, of, of objectivism, built around the thesis explored in her novels. The, this presentation will discuss two of Rand's nonfiction philosophical works, The Virtues of Selfishness and Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, Tucker discussing the former and Travis discussing the latter. Will, uh, both will elaborate on the tenets of Rand's philosophy. So, I think Ms. Justin Tucker, you're speaking first, correct? Yeah. And if you're ready, let's welcome uh, yeah, let's go. Justin yeah. Tucker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. First shall be last. Hey, I like it. Turn it over. Oh, he brought a sign. <laughs> Greetings, friends. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Justin Tucker. I'm chair of the Libertarian Party of Chicago. I am joined uh, by my colleague and longtime LP activist, David Travis, in this uh, presentation about Ayn Rand. I want to thank the College of Complexes for hosting us. And we respect the work that Charlie and Tim do uh, here for free speech. Also, during the rebuttal period, I encourage my libertarian friends to come up and speak. I guarantee you it'll be fun. Uh, for those interested, the Libertarian Party Chicago usually meets first Tuesdays at the Piggery on Irving Park Road, uh, starting at 7 p.m. Everyone is invited to join us. Willie Wilson has been to a meeting. Pat Quinn has been to a meeting. David Ramsey Steele has been to a meeting, so we're a pretty happening uh, club for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, our next meeting will feature Senate, uh, State Representative Brad uh, Halbrook, who introduced House Resolution 0101 calling for the political separation of Chicago and Illinois. Uh, he'll be joined by G.H. Merritt of New Illinois, an organization that aims for separation, so please join us. Uh, I'd like to preference, uh, preface this talk by saying that the Libertarian Party is not an objectivist organization and some of Rand's positions do not reconcile with the LP platform. When asked what she thought about the Libertarian Party, she said, I'd rather vote for Bob Hope, the Marx Brothers, or Jerry Lewis. She also said, for the record, I shall not repeat what I have said many times before. I do, not join, I do not join or endorse any political group or movement. More specifically, I disapprove of, disagree with, and have no connection with the, the latest aberration of some conservatives, the so-called hippies of the right, who attempt to snare the younger and more careless ones of my readers by claiming simu simultaneously to be followers of my philosophy and advocates of anarchism. Nonetheless, Libertarian Party founder David Nolan said of the author, Without Ayn Rand, the libertarian movement would not exist. So tonight, Mr. Travis and I will examine two of Rand's non-fiction works. I'll discuss The Virtue of Selfishness. Dave will discuss Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. This presentation is not an endorsement of objectivism, but merely an examination of the philosophy within the context of the history of the libertarian movement. First, some biographical data on Ayn Rand. 
She was born Melissa <laughs> Rosenbaum 19, in 1905 in St. Petersburg, Russia. Her father was a pharmacist and they had a very comfortable existence. After the October Revolution in 1917, her father's pharmacy was seized by the Bolsheviks and her family found refuge in, in Crimea where she graduated high school. Her family returns to St. Petersburg or Petrograd as it has been renamed and they face some very hard times. But Rand was able to go to college and graduate despite being purged from the university. In 1925, she comes to Chicago to stay with relatives. She finds the United States to be a marvelous place, and she comes to believe in the ideals of the founding of the United States. She goes to Hollywood to hit, it, to hit the big time, and she eventually becomes an extra in Cecil B. DeMille's King of Kings, where she meets Frank O'Connor, who she later, later married. She worked various jobs in Hollywood, including writing screenplays. Her 1934 stage play, Night of January 16th, was first produced in that year. In 1936, her first novel, semi-autobiographical We the Living, is published. And that was followed by the dystopian Anthem in 1938. Her novel, The Fountainhead, is published in 1943 and is about an uncompromising architect named Howard Rourke. It was adapted into a 1949 film starring Gary Cooper. In 1957, her magnum opus, Atlas Shrugged, is published. This didactic dystopian novel outlines her philosophy uh, and tells the story of railroad tycoon Dagny Tagger and the industrialist Hank Reardon and their search for the mysterious John Galt. I do not recommend watching the movies based on, on that book, by the way. After Atlas Shrugged, Rand quit writing novels to focus on writing on philosophy. Her first nonfiction work was For a New Intellectual, which was mostly a collection of excerpts from her novels. Her next few books, The Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, The Romantic Manifesto, and The New Left, The Anti-Industrial Revolution, were mostly a collection of essays with some contributions from protege and former lover Nathaniel Brandon and future chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan. In 1979, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology was published as a complete book, having been previously serialized in her newsletters. Rand died in 1982 in New York, the same year that saw the publication of Philosophy Who Needs It. And that's a brief overview of her nonfiction, which brings us to the virtue of selfishness. Here are the first few sentences of the introduction. The title of the, of the book may invoke the question that I hear once in a while. Why do you use selfish to donate virtuous qualities of character when that word antagonizes so many people to whom it does not mean the things you mean? To those who ask it, my answer is for this, the reason that it makes you afraid of it. Rand was being deliberately provocative. She's what the kids today would call a troll. She wanted to shake the perception that selfishness is evil and that man is a brute without altruism to quell his supposedly violent nature. She, def she defines selfishness as, quote, concern with one's own interest, which has no connotation with good or evil. The purpose of the book was to introduce readers to her philosophy's position on ethics. She says, the, object the objectivist ethics holds that the actor must always be the beneficiary of his action, and that man must act for, this, for his own rational self-interest. But his right to do so is derived from his nature as man, and from the function of moral values in human life, and therefore is applicable only in the context of a rational, objectively demonstrated and validated code of moral principles which define and determine his actual self-interest. The first chapter of the book is called The Objectivist Ethics, which was originally a lecture. It is the longest chapter in the book. She writes, what is morality or ethics? It is a code of values to guide man's choices and actions that determine the purpose and the course of his life. Ethics as a science deals with discovering and defining such a code. 
Rand felt that most ethics throughout history were derived from whims, mysticism, appeals to authority, and what's good for society, all of which she considered irrational. So she tried to derive an ethical code from reason. She defines value as, quote, that which one acts to gain and or keep, and presupposes a living entity. Since all living entities need to act to survive, its life is the standard of value. Rand asserts that humans discover the concept of value through the physical sensations of pleasure and pain and perception. She says, quote, the physical sensation of, play, of pleasure is a signal indication that the organism is pursuing the right course of action. The physical, the physical sensation of pain is a warning signal of danger, indication that the organism is pursuing the wrong course of action, that something is impairing the proper function of its body, which requires action to correct it. Man, unlike plants and other animals, has no automatic code of survival, no, adi no automatic course of action, no automatic set of values, but however, can retain knowledge and conceptualize. In other words, through thinking and, and the faculty of reason, which is the faculty that man has to exercise by choice, man may feel the sensation of hunger, but he does not know how to hunt or to gather food. Nor does he know what food is good for him. Man must then use his brain and think and retain knowledge as his means of sustaining his life. She writes, quote, a being who does not automatically know what is true or false cannot automatically know what is right or wrong, what is good for him or evil. What then are the right goals for man to pursue? What are the values his survival requires? That is the question to be answered by the science of ethics. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why one needs a code of ethics. If some men, if some men attempt to survive by means of brute force or fraud, by looting, robbing, cheating, or enslaving the men who produce it, it still remains true that their survival is made possible only by their victims, only by the men who choose to think and to produce the goods to say the looters are stealing. Such looters are parasites incapable of survival, who exist by destroying those who are capable and those who are pursuing a course of, of action proper to man. The men who attempt to survive, not by means of reason, but by means of force, are attempting to survive, to survive by, the mean, by the methods of animals. Is it? But just as animals would not be able to survive by attempting the method of plants by rejecting locomotion and waiting for the soil to feed them, so men cannot survive by attempting the method of animals, by rejecting reason and counting on productive men to serve as their prey. Such looters may achieve their goals for the range of the moment, at the price of destruction, destruction of their victims and their own. As evidence, offer, I offer you any criminal or any dictatorship. Rand describes the three cardinal values of, objective, of objectivist ethics as reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Their three corresponding virtues are rationality, productiveness, and pride. Quote, productive work is the central purpose of a rational man's life, and the central value that integrates and determines the hierarchy of all of their values. Reason is the source, the precondition of his productive work. Pride is the result. Irrationality is the rejection of man's means of survival, and therefore, a commitment to a course of blind destruction, that which is anti-mind, is anti-life. The basic social principle of the objectivist ethics is that just as life is an end in and of itself, so every living being is an end in itself, not the means to the ends or the welfare of others, and therefore that man must live for his own sake neither sacrificing himself to others nor sacrificing uh, others to himself. To live for his own sake means that the achievement of his own happiness is man's highest moral purpose. The principle of trade is the only rational ethical principle for which human relationships, personal or social, private or public, spiritual and material, it's the principle of justice. The basic political principle of the objectivist ethics is no man may initiate the use of physical force against others. No man or group or society or government has the right to assume the role of a criminal and initiate the use of physical compulsion against any man. 
Men have the right to use physical force only in retaliation and only against those who initiate its use. The only proper moral use of government is to protect men's rights, which means to protect him from physical violence, to protect his right to his own life, to his own liberty, to his own property, and to the pursuit of his own happiness. Without property rights, no other rights are possible. And that is the basic summary of the ethics of objectivism. To the question of, does life require compromise, Rand answers, a compromise is an adjustment of the conflicting claims by mutual concessions. This means that both parties to a compromise have valid claim and some value to offer the other. That means that both parties agree upon the fundamental principle which serves as the base of their deal. Trade, in other words. There can be no compromise between a property, property owner and a burglar. There can be no compromise between freedom and government controls. There can be no compromise on basic principles or fundamental issues. Today, however, when people speak of compromise, they, they mean an what they mean is not a legitimate mutual concession or trade, but precisely the betrayal of one's principles. Unilateral surrender to any groundless or rational claim. So Rand was opposed to ethical subjectivism because it facil uh, facilitated his newer faux sense of compromise. It renders man without integrity and is a betrayal of oneself. To the question of how does one lead a rational life in an irrational society? Rand answers, one must never fail to pronounce moral judgment. In this, she is deliberately aiming to challenge Christian teaching, specifically, judge not and be prepared to be judged. Quote, the opposite of moral neutrality is not blind, arbitrary, self-righteous condemnation of any idea, action, or person that does not fit one's mood, one's moralized slogans or one snap judgment of the moment. Indiscriminate tolerance and indiscriminate can condemnation are not two opposites. They are two variants of the same equation, uh, same evasion. To declare that everybody is white or everybody is black or everybody is neither white nor black but gray is not a moral judgment but an escape from the responsibility of moral judgment. If people did not indulge in such abject evasions as the claim that some contemptible liar may mean well, that a mooching bum can't help it, that a juvenile delinquent needs love, that a criminal does not know any better, know any better that a power-seeking politician is moved by patriotic concern for the public good, that communists are merely agrarian reformers, the history of the past few decades or century would have been different. Rand elaborates on this idea of the gray in her essay, The Cult of Moral Grayness. She says, before one can identify anything as gray, one has to know what is good and what is evil. And when a man has ascertained that one alternative is good and the other is evil, he has no justification for choosing a mixture. There can be no justification for choosing any part of that which one knows to be evil. In morality, black is predominantly a result of attempting to pretend to oneself that one is merely gray. Observe in politics that the term, ex that the term extremism has become a synonym of evil, regardless of the context of the issue. The evil is not what you are extreme about, but that you are extreme, i.e. consistent. Observe the phenomenon of the so-called neutralists in the United Nations. The neutralists are worse than merely neutral in the conflict between the United States and Soviet Russia. They are committed on principle to see no difference between the two sides, never to consider the merits of an issue, and always to seek a compromise, any compromise in any conflict, as for instance between an aggressor and an invaded country. Her essay, Collectivized Ethics, seeks to challenge said notion. She references her protege, Barbara Brandon, who answers the question, what will happen to the poor in an objectivist society? By saying, if you want to help them, you will not be stopped. Rand writes, only individual men have the right to decide when, or rather, who they should 
wish to help and when to help others. Society as an organized political system has no rights at the matter at all. At all. If a man speculates on what society should do for the poor, he accepts thereby the collectivist premise that men's lives be, belong to society and that he as a member of society has the right to dispose of them, to set their goals, or to plan the distribution of their efforts. Medicare is an example of such project. Isn't it desirable to the age to have medical care in times of illness? Its advocates clamor. Considered out of context, the answer would be yes, it is desirable. Who would have a reason to say no? And it is at this point that the mental process of a collectivized brain are cut off. The rest is fog. The fog hides such facts as the enslavement and therefore the destruction of medical science, the regimentation and the disintegration of all medical freedom, the careers, the ambitions, the achievements, the happiness, the lives of the very men who are to provide that desired goal, the doctors. After centuries of civilization, most men, with the exception of criminals, have learned that the above mental attitude is neither practical nor moral in their <laughs> private lives. It may not be applied to the achievement of their private goals. There would be no controversy about the moral character of some young hoodlum who declared, isn't it desirable to have a yacht, to live in a penthouse and to drink champagne, and stubbornly, stubbornly refuse to consider the fact that he had robbed a bank and killed two guards to achieve that desired goal? There is no moral difference between these two examples. The number of beneficiaries does not change the nature of the action. It merely increases the number of victims. In fact, the private hoodlum has a slight edge on a moral superiority. He has no power to devastate an entire nation, and his victims are not legally disarmed. Yet. Soviet Russia is the, cl is the clearest, but not the only illustration of the achievements of collectivized mentalities. Two generations of Russians have, have toiled and died in misery, waiting for the abundance promised by their rulers, who pleased for patience and commanded austerity, while building public industrialization and killing public hope in five-year installments. At first, the people starved while waiting for electric generator, generators and tractors. They are still starving while waiting for atomic energy and international interplanetary travel. <laughs> Harassi, the monument builders, dismisses the idea that socialism can be regarded as benevolent political theory. Quote, the alleged goals of soci socialism were the abolition of, pro of poverty, the achievement of general prosperity, progress, peace, and human brotherhood. The results have been a terrifying failure. Terrifying, that is, if one's motive is men's welfare. Socialism is not a movement of the people, it is a movement of the intellectuals, originated and controlled by the intellectuals, carried out of their stuffy ivory towers into the bloody fields of, pa of practice where they unite with their allies and executor executors, the thugs. What then is the motive of such intellectuals? Power lust as a manifestation of helplessness, self-loathing, and the desire of the unearned. Since there is no such entity as the public, since the public is merely a number of individuals, any claimed or implied conflict of the public interest with private interest means that the interests of some men are to be sacrificed to the interests and wishes of others. Since the concept is so conveniently undefinable, its use rests only on any given gang's ability to proclaim that the public say more and to maintain that claim at the point of a gun. Rand begins her essay, Men's Rights, by saying, if one wishes to advocate a free society, that is capitalism, one must realize that its indispensable foundation is the principle of individual rights. If one wishes to uphold individual rights, one must realize that capitalism is the only system that can uphold and protect them. Rights are a moral concept, the concept that provides a logical transition from the principles 
guiding an individual's action to the principal's guiding his relationship with others. The concept that preserves and protects individual morality in a social context. The link between the moral code of a man and the legal code of society. Between ethics and politics. Individual rights are the means of subordinate society to moral law. Randon describes that most, throughout most of history, individuals were subordinated to a higher authority, and thus those were immoral societies. She then writes, the most profoundly revolutionary achievement of the United States of America was the subordination of society to moral law. The principle of man's individual rights represent, represented an extension of morality into the social system as a limitation on the power of the state, as man's protection against the brute force of the collective, as a subordination of might to right. The United States was the first moral society in history. The United States regarded man as an end in himself, and society as a means to the peaceful, orderly, voluntary coexistence of individuals. To violate man's rights means to compel him to act against his own judgment, or to expropriate his values. Basically, there is only one way to do it, by the use of physical force. There are two potential violators of man's rights, the criminals and the government. The right to life means that a man has the right to support his life by his own work on any economic level as high as his ability can carry him. It does not mean that others must provide him with the necessities of life. The right to property means that a man has the right to take economic actions necessary to earn property, to use and dispose of it. it does not mean that others must provide him with property. The right to free speech means that a man has the right to express his ideas without danger of suppression, interference, or punitive action by the government. It does not mean that others must provide him with a lecture hall, a radio station, or a printing press through which to express his ideas. In the chapter entitled The Nature of Government, Rand defines government as, quote, an institution that holds the exclusive power to enforce certain rules of social contact, conduct in a given geographical area. The, pre the precondition of a civilized society is the barring of physical force from social relationships, thus establishing the principle that if men wish to deal with one another, they may do so only by means of reason, by discussion, persuasion, and voluntary, uncoerced agreement. The necessary consequence of a man's right to life is his right to self-defense. In a civilized society, force might be used only in retaliation and only against those who initiate its use. All the reasons which make the initiation of physical force an evil retaliate the retaliatory use of physical force a moral imperative. Rand believed that without an organ organized protection against force, society would degenerate into, quote, the chaos of gang rule, i.e., rule by brute force into perpetual tribal warfare, warfare of prehistoric savages. She continues, the, re the retaliatory use of force requires objective rules of evidence to establish that a crime has been committed and to, and to prove who committed it, as well as an objective rule to define punishments and enforcement procedures. <laughs> if physical force is to be barred from social relationships, Men must need an institution charged with the task of protecting their rights under an objective code of rules. This is the task of government, of a proper government, its basic task, its only moral justification, and the reason why men do need a government. A government is the means of placing the retaliatory use of physical force under objective control, i.e., under objectively defined laws. The fundamental difference between private action and government action, a difference thoroughly ignored and invaded today, lies in the fact that a government holds a monopoly on the legal use of physical force. It, is, it has to hold such a monopoly since it's the agent of the restraining and combating the use of force. And for that very same reason, its actions have been rigidly defined, delimited, and circumscribed. <laughs> Since 
Since the protection of individual rights is the only proper purpose of a government, it is the only proper the uh, it is the only proper subject of legislation. All laws must be based on individual rights and aimed at their protection. The source of the government's authority is the consent of the governed. This means that the government is not the ruler, but the servant or agent of its citizens. It means that the government as such has no rights except the rights delegated to it by the citizens for a specific purpose. In a free society, men are not forced to deal with another. They do so by voluntary agreement and when a time element is involved by contract. If a contract is broken by the arbitrary decision of one man, it may cause a disastrous financial injury to the other. And the victim would have no recourse except to seize the offender's property as compensation. But here again, the use of force cannot be left to the decision of private individuals. And this leads to one of the most important and most complex functions of the government, to function as an arbiter of who settles disputes among men according to objective laws. Rand then critiques the tendency among anarchists and some libertarians to support what she calls, quote, the weird absurdity called competing governments. Polycentric law is a term that describes this idea. Quote, the idea of a single monopolistic government, they declare, should be a number of different governments in, a, in the same geographical area, competing for the allegiance of individual citizens, and every citizen free to shop and patronize whatever government he chooses. Remember that forcible restraint of men is the only service a government has to offer. Ask yourself what a competition and forcible restraint would have to mean. Rand goes on to lament the growth of statism despite the promise of morality in the American system. Quote, instead of being a protector of man's rights, the government is becoming their most dangerous violator. Instead of guarding freedom, the government is, est is establishing slavery. Instead of protecting men from the initiators of physical force, the government is ini initiating physical force and coercion in any manner and issue it pleases. Instead of serving as the instrument of, of, of objectivity and human relationships, the government is creating a deadly subterranean reign of uncertainty and fear by means of non-objective laws whose interpretation is left to the arbitrary decisions of random bureaucrats. Instead of protecting men from injury by whim, the government is arrogating to itself the power of unlimited whim. So we are fast approaching the stage of ultimate inversion the stage where the government is free to do anything it pleases, while the citizens may act only by permission, which is a stage of the darkest periods of human history, the stage of rule by brute force. What would be, proper, what would be the proper method of financing the government in a fully free society? The question is usually asked in connection with the objectivist principle that the government of a free society may not, may not initiate the use of force, it may only use force in retaliation against those who initiate its use. Since the imposition of taxes does represent an initiation of force, how is it at, how it, it is asked would the government of a free society raise the money needed to finance its services? Voluntarily, of course. What methods? A government law, lottery for one. Another method Rand suggests is paying a premium to the government in the sum of a legally fixed percentage of the sums involved to pay for the enforcement of contracts, including all credit transactions because they are contractual agreements. Since the number of credit transactions is uh, great, that would cover the cost of running a government on objectivist prescribed ideals. Her chapter entitled Racism is perhaps my favorite in the book. It begins like this. Racism is the lowest, most crudely primitive form of collectivism. It is the notion of ascribing moral, social, or political significance to a man's genetic lineage. The notion that a man's intellectual and characterological traits are produced and transmitted by his internal body chemistry. 
which means in practice that a man is to be judged not by his own character and actions, but by the character and actions of a collective of ancestors. The theory that hold that hold good blood or bad blood as moral intellectual criterion can lead to nothing but torrents of blood in practice. Brute force is the only avenue of action open to men who regard themselves as violent aggregates of chemicals. Just as there is no such thing as a collective or racial mind, there is no such thing as collective or racial achievement. There are only individual minds and individual achievements. And a culture is not the anonymous product of undifferentiated masses, but the sum of the intellectual achievements of individual men. A genius is a genius regarding the number of morons who belong to the same race. And a moron is a moron regardless of the number of geniuses who shares racial origin. To ascribe one's virtues to one's racial origin is to confess that one has no knowledge of the process by which virtues are acquired, and most often that one has failed to acquire them. The overwhelming majority of racists are men who claim no individual achievement or distinction, who seek the illusion of a tribal self-esteem by alleging the inferiority of some tribe. Observe the hysterical intensity of the southern racists. Observe that racism is much more prevalent among the poor white trash than among their intellectual betters. There's only one antidote to racism. The philosophy of individualism and its political, socioeconomic corollary, laissez-faire capitalism. No political system can establish universal rationality by law or by force. But capitalism is the only system that functions in a way that rewards rationality and, pe and penalizes all forms of irrationality, including racism. She then qualifies the role of capitalism by saying that America has never been fully, a fully free capitalist society. But its emergence has erased racial, or eased, I should say, racial tensions. And she argued that racism is increased when the state increases, because the state will appeal to tribalism. She described the situation in the relatively free northern United States after the Civil War, or as the great era of capitalism, as she, as she calls it as time when people from all over the world came together to be productive members of society. The melting pot, as it were. She's, she does recognize that the amount of racial prejudice, prejudice perpetuated on black folks uh, that was going on concurrently as the melting pot. Quote, the policy of the southern states towards Negroes was and is a shameful contradiction of this country's basic principles. Racial discrimination imposed and enforced by law so blatantly inexcusable an infringement of individual rights that the racist statutes of the South, of the South should have been declared un unconstitutional long ago. The Southern racist claim of states' rights is a contradiction in terms. There can be no such thing as the right of some men to violate the rights of others. The liberals are guilty of the same contradiction, but in a different form. They advocate the sacrifice of all individual rights to unlimited majority rule, yet posture as defenders of the rights of minorities. But the smallest minority on each is the individual. Those who deny individual, individual rights cannot claim to be defenders of minorities. She pointed to racial quotas as an example of this, since it implies that white folks are collectively guilty of the racial prejudice of their ancestors. She also cited prohibitions on private discrimination as another example. Quote, it is proper to forbid all discrimination in government-owned facilities and establishments. The government has no right to discriminate against any citizens. And by that very same principle, the government has no right to discriminate from some citizens at the expense of others. There's no right to violate the right of pri private property by forbidding discrimination in privately owned establishments. No man, neither Negro or white, has any claim to the property of another man. A man's rights are not violated by a private individual's refusal to deal with them. Racism is an evil, irrational, and morally contemptible doctrine. But doctrines 
can't be forgiven, cannot be forgiven or prescribed by law. Just as we have to protect a communist freedom of speech, even though his doctrines are evil, we have a right, we have to protect a racist right to use and dispose of his own property. Uh, I wish I could cover more, uh, but unfortunately, out of my time for this portion, um, I would recommend everybody reading The Virtue of Selfishness for themselves. And now I would like to introduce David Travis. As already mentioned, uh, Anne Rand wrote a book, Capitalism. <clears throat> Can I be heard here? Yes. Can I be heard? Can everyone hear me? Anne Rand wrote a book entitled Capitalism, The Unknown Idea. It's very good reading. It's extremely interesting. Uh, and I'm supposed to be giving a talk tonight on capitalism. Well, I'm going to get to that in just a moment. here is called the Anne Rand Lexicon, and it uh, defines many words that Anne Rand used in her books. Uh, I'm merely going to point out one of them, which says gold standard, and it says gold and economic freedom are inseparable. The gold standard is an instrument of laissez-faire and each implies and requires the other. What medium of exchange will be acceptable to all participants in an economy is not determined arbitrarily where store of value considerations are, are important as they are in richer, more civilized societies. The medium of exchange must be durable, must be a durable commodity, usually a metal. A metal is generally chosen because it is homogeneous and divise, divisible. Every unit is the same as every other, and it can be blended or formed in any quantity. Precious jewels, for example, are neither homogeneous nor divisible. More important, the commodity chosen as a medium must be a luxury. Human desire for luxuries are, limit, are unlimited, and therefore luxury goods are always in demand and will always be acceptable. The term luxury good implies scarcity and high unit value. Having a high unit value, such a good is easily portable. For instance, an ounce of gold is worth a half ton of pig iron. Under the gold standard, a free banking system stands as the protector of an economy's stability and balanced growth. In the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. There is no 
safe store of value if there were the government would have to make its holding illegal as was done in the case of gold. The financial policy of the welfare state requires that there be no way for the owners of wealth to protect themselves. This is the shabby secret of the welfare statists tirades against gold. Deficit spending is simply a scheme for the hidden confiscation of wealth. Gold stands in the way of this insidious process. It stands as a protector of property rights. If, once, if one grasps this, one has no difficulty in understanding the status antagonism toward the gold standard. The fact is, money is gold, and gold is money. The market is ruled by a single moral principle, justice, and that is the root of their hatred of capitalism. That is the statists and socialists. Government intervention is, is the cause of monopolies. Railroads, telephone, utilities, electric and gas, under capitalism, monopolies are not allowed to exist. <clears throat> As Ayn Rand points out, if a man invents something that gives him a monopoly, others would invent around it. But even so, an inventor has only seven years before his patent expires and his invention goes in the public domain. Capitalism is free enterprise. Many of you probably think I am going to give a glorification of capitalism talk, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going Instead, I'm going to try to explain aspects of capitalism and many misconceptions of it. Many people hate capitalism and blame capitalism for the troubles in the world. For, for instance, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, Pol Pot, Victor Chavez, Fidel Castro, etc., none of whom were capitalists, all of them tyrants. On the, can I please have your attention? No. On the other hand, Bernie Madoff. Roger Rotnam, the Alderdice brothers, Michael Milken, Ivan Bosky, etc. There. Hey, can you please give me your attention? I don't have to stand on my hind legs to do this. On the other hand, Bernie Madoff, Roger Rotnam, the Alderdice brothers, Michael Milken, Ivan Bosky, etc., very bad men, on their on the other hand, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett gave great sums of money to improve conditions in a very poor country. 
Many people believe capitalism is the opposite of communism. But that is not so. The opposite of capitalism is, in fact, altruism. Which says man must exist for the sake of everyone else. Communism holds that man should share and share alike to each according to his need, from each according to his productivity. But all true, hey, come on. One bullet time, guys. But altruism says no matter how much you produce, you are not entitled to anything. In my mind, altruism is of the ugly, is one of the ugliest concepts in existence. Capitalism provides a level playing field. It certainly allows political autonomy. So even if you're not interested in making money, if you wish to be a hobo or an artist on the street or whatever, under capitalism you have that right. Uh, under, com under communism you would be expected to follow a certain course of action to be a uh, uh, some kind of a certain worker or specialize in this or that. Yeah, under capitalism, you can do whatever the hell you want. Uh, so you are uh, able to to live a life of autonomy. Uh, many men that have been very successful have been rejected for other things. Uh, that is basically the sum of what I have to say tonight, and so I hope that uh, I haven't bored you stiff. Thank you, and good night. Questions from the audience? Dave? Questions from the audience? Is there a moderator tonight? We have a new moderator. Ed, you gonna do it? All right, I guess I can moderate. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. We'll go uh, right here, right here. All right, I got a question for you. Where is, oh, I'm sorry. You said uh, there, that there wasn't supposed to be any taxation yeah. under your system? On, on no, the uh, taxation, voluntarily, uh, voluntary. Taxation. Now, what would that encounter? That would be the wealthy people donating the money and controlling the public, the political environment, would it? I mean, it's just, they, they would step in, the money would control all that, right? Uh, yes, there's concern that because the rich would probably be more likely to pay into it, that that would, uh, that they would, I guess, uh, discriminate against others to, uh, to well, use it. But it's in their interest to not do that, so therefore, <laughs> they would, you know, they, they don't, if you want a, if you want a, culture where you can thrive and engage in commerce it's in your interest to have armies and pol you know police and and that everybody uh, the law the rule of law applies to everybody so everybody doesn't contribute to the, to the, uh, gov the participation of government yeah Rand's uh, taxes uh, I guess tax uh, proposals would be more progressive in that regard and not regressive yes <coughs> do you want to comment on that question uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. The, the, the point is, you, you, you don't have taxation, so the people who voluntarily, that means the wealthy people, the, 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 the influential, will donate, control the political uh, environment. Uh, it's it's going to happen automatically. I mean, no question in, about it. In the first place, uh, my understanding is uh, the vote determines the political environment. Uh, and, please, sir, me, please. you can shake your head all you like. A dog can do that, too. Yeah. In any event, as I wanted to say, that, uh, uh, as John Locke pointed out, there may be a community of people who live in houses and 
have celebrations and dances and one thing and another. Uh, and there may be another guy who's a real nice guy that lives in a tree. And the people say to him, come on out of your tree. Come and live in our community where there will be dances and there will be celebrations and we'll all have a good time and you'll enjoy it too. And if anybody robs you or rapes your wife or your daughter, you can appeal to the town and we'll put together a posse and we'll go after the guilty people and we'll bring them to justice. And you don't have to pay anything. You don't have to, to uh, be part of that. You don't even have to be a part of the posse. All we ask of you is that you simply not do any of the things that we will arrest someone and put them in jail for. So you can live in our society without having to contribute as long as you don't contribute to the violence. Does that answer, Does your, that question? answer your question? And I want to give a real life example. Uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, like in, in, in neighborhoods, even in Chicago, uh, you people who live on a particular block will hire private security, and everybody on that block, because one person or a few decided to go in on, you know, uh, having a guy, you know, hang out on the block to to to, to watch, to keep watch. Everybody benefits because of those few individuals. And those individuals are aware that people will be benefiting from it without paying in, and they're fine with that. So not everybody is, yeah, yeah. Over here. I'd like to know a little bit about the difference between the Ayn Rand philosophy and the one propagated by uh, Milton Fried uh, Friedman. You know, uh, take that one on me. Uh, Milton Friedman's is sort of an offshoot of Ayn Rand. Uh, Milton Friedman was a Randist. Okay. Uh, uh, Rand uh, had more. Milton Friedman was more of a consequentialist. He believed that you know if the government acts this way, that'll give us the most amount of liberty and the most amount of prosperity. Rand was more of an epistemological sort of background. Because uh, she was so dedicated to reason and, you know, men using their brains to discover their, you know, she, her approach to it and where she derives that is more from a epistemological standpoint. Charlie? Yeah, yesterday and today there were demonstrations against the president who's putting children into prisons. But according to what I heard just now, in a capitalist, non-altruistic Ayn Rand society, you guys wouldn't go to the rallies, and it'd be perfectly appropriate to say, since you don't have any children in there, to say, that's not my problem. Is the phrase, it's not my problem, appropriate to say in an Ayn Rand society? For the, if you're talking specifically about uh, border uh, attainments of the border, it's a phrase. It's no, not quite problem. Appropriate in an end round. Yeah, no, it's not appropriate because right? you're and built. You just built a very clear. big straw man and misrep. You know, it's easier for you to restate something that sounds worse than what we actually said. There, and that, that's what you basically do, Charlie. Yeah, you build straw man. Wait, 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 wait. wait. He had a general question. And I already answered it. And, and uh, your answer was? My answer was no, it's not appropriate because that's no, that's not what they no. think, Charlie. Oh, you have a follow up? I want to hear why it's not appropriate. That's his follow up. Why is it not appropriate? Yeah. It's not appropriate because in the United States of America, we should deal <coughs> with our citizens and not with a thousand and one foreign people. I know we had a problem a while back with people from some other country that were uh, 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 circumcising women. And this was absolutely against our policies. And uh, yes, 
there were people who were sneaking and doing this. I think this was all finally cleared up. So when we have people here that don't belong here in the first place, we should get them out of the country and let them become citizens. If they want, let them a petition for a citizenship. Thank you very much, Charlie. Well, I don't think that that was actually a brand's position, considering she was an immigrant and fled uh, the UK the you know, Soviet Russia. She be trying to get back to prison. What kind of philosophy? All right. All right. Ayn Rand defines <coughs> selfishness <coughs> as concern about oneself. She means concern about oneself. Wow. Let me finish my question. She means concern about her oneself only. How is this not sheer greed? Isn't this saying greed is good, as Gordon Gecko said in, in Wall Street? It seems that way to me. It's totally that way. She's saying, you know, you make money, you keep it, and that's it. You know, and hell with everyone else and anything else. When did she say that? Money. And, and the virtue of selfishness. When, when, which the, chapter did she say first that verbatim? One, first one. That's her main theme throughout the book. She said underline. not to care about anybody and just, you know, who cares, yes. and keep yes. all the money, and that's what she said. I, I read that book, and I'm afraid self. that's not was it in there, sir. I'll read you the quote. Selfishness. Um, is concerned Why, with uh, one's on own interest. And she means only. She makes it very, it's very clear throughout her book. She's only concerned about yeah. your own interests and the hell with everyone else's interests. They're on their own. It's every Would be taking care himself. of your sick mother be in your own interest? No. Pardon me? Would taking care of, of your mother who you love and, oh, and no, you I value mean. your mother, would that be in your own interest? Well, sure, in mine. And Rand, I don't know. She uses that as an, as an example. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Over here? What about those children? Uh, Dave wants to comment on that. All right. First of all, there, there are certain uh, uh, political philosophers on the right side that say that we that there is no such thing as an unselfish end. That whatever you do uh, usually has benefit to other people. Uh, we we um, uh, a man that makes a, a million dollars. Let's say uh, a guy comes from a foreign country and opens a restaurant and makes a million dollars over 20 years in his restaurant. The people working the restaurant make some money. And Charlie, that will do. That's true? Uh, I said that will do. Uh, to finish what I was saying, a man makes a million dollars over 20 years in his restaurant. All by himself. He, Charlie, I'm going to try this one more time. Okay. And I'm going to ask you very sincerely to please shut up. <laughs> a man makes a million dollars in a restaurant over 20 years. He had the benefit of an awfully lot. Sid, one full at a time, please. Um, he had to make a lot of money for a lot of other people the light company, the gas company, the bread company, the meat company, uh, the landlord, uh, all kinds of people had to benefit from his efforts over 20 years of being here and running a restaurant. So when, when you talk about the virtue of selfishness, tell me something that is selfish, and I'll show you how it's not selfish. Wait, I can't hear the man. He's not that big. He's paying his waiters very poorly. They live on tips. Oh, now we're conditionalizing it, saying he's paying his waiters very poorly. Maybe he's paying his waiters very handsomely. No, they don't. They pay about $3 an hour. That's how much he makes. 
And that's what they all do across the board. Yeah. Yes. Well, then if they don't like that, they can always go and work someplace else. Oh. All right. Max. All right. Heather, you want to give her a rebuttal? Send you a All right. Let's let's hear the next question. Sid. He said all people do that things my problem. for selfishness on the <coughs> own, right? What? People that help other people also do it for themselves. Yeah, for selfish reasons. Yeah, but there's people in history, I can name three right now, Fidel Castro, Lenin, and Marx, all comes from the upper middle class. How did that, going into a revolution, and maybe getting killed helped them personally. They could, they could have been philosophers or lawyer, great lawyers or anything else. Well, if, we take, uh, if we take Lenin, for instance, uh, Lenin, when he was a little boy, he had a big brother who was caught in, in espionage activities and he was executed. So Lenin vowed that he was going to get the Tsar and he lived to destroy the Tsar. When, when the Bolsheviks came to power, Lenin absolutely insisted that the Tsar and his whole family be wiped out. So uh, Lenin had his reasons for doing what he did. Thank you. Yeah. I would also like to, uh, uh, I would also like to add that uh, if, if you desire you know, communist revolution or whatever, and you feel that if, if you selfishly want that, you will, pro, you know, as Che Guevara did, you will voluntarily go to places and, and fight for that sort of stuff. So I, 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 I voluntarily donate my time to the Libertarian Party. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't profit from it, but I desire, you know, the, I value freedom, so I'm gonna, selfishly, you know, to get freedom for myself, I will volunteer a lot of my time to organize for libertarian oh, stuff. Over here. I just want to say, in sorry, a libertarian I'm society, sorry. I would retain my right to voluntarily choose communism. And I wanted to ask, um, don't you think it's kind of an sorry. unfair negative characterization of altruism to kind of say it's about putting people's <laughs> needs before your own and being compelled to do so? Um, People should, in a free society, still have the right to sacrifice or risk or you know, get, even give to someone they think can hurt them if, if they want, if they want to take that risk, but they shouldn't be compelled to do so. Do you think that, do you think Ayn Rand would say that it's okay uh, if people to choose to sacrifice if, that's, if they feel like it? And is really, do you really think that every act of, that helps someone else is always, um, it's, it's not, I mean, you know, parents, for example, Ayn Rand didn't have children. Like, uh, like parents were willing to undergo sacrifice and risk to save their children, and that's a complete sacrifice on their part. And they should, be, should not be required to make those decisions if they're difficult decisions. They should be allowed to. What, what's the question? If you want to think, you, you want to think, think that's that. the question? Should, should, should people be allowed to make sacrifices even if it doesn't benefit their own self-interest? Yes, you can do whatever you want as long as you're happy. Even if the reasons are wrong. <laughs> Over there in the back. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it correct to say that you pretty much see the government as uh, its sole responsibility is protection, military, police? I I would agree that that is the uh, <laughs> proper. If we're to have a government, that, that those should be the specific things that they do provide protection. Why do you think that, say, uh, health care or transportation or education or any of those things uh, shouldn't be done by the government? You want to take a stab at that, Dave? Uh, yeah, I didn't quite follow the question. Why should, uh, why should uh, health care and uh, if, if, if protection in courts can be free, why can't health care transportation, whatever, be subsidized? Uh, because they uh, directly conflict with private industry in running 
their business of transportation or health care. And so when the government steps into the health care business, they begin to stack the deck in their favor. And so, for, for instance, when Obama established his health care, his Obamacare, uh, it, um, uh, I was told that if I didn't want to have any other health care, that I'd have to pay $800 each year into the program in order to cover my share of the health care, whether I wanted it or not. So you, you see, so you see, health care is something that should be in the private sector and transportation as well. Uh, I remember when uh, there were streetcars that ran on tracks in, in this, on the city streets and it cost about a dime or 15 cents to ride the streetcar. Uh, they begged the uh, city transportation councils and so on to allow them to raise the uh, rate, but they wouldn't allow them to do it. And so they finally went bankrupt. And then, of course, uh, the city transportation people, known as the CTA, took over. And the first thing they did was raise the rates. They have the exclusive privilege of running a transportation system in Chicago. Uh, I used to like to tell a story about a guy that comes up here from Mississippi and accidentally hits the lottery for a lot of money and says, I'm going to establish my own private bus service for all the people. And so he does that and his buses don't run for an hour before the men from the Public Utility Commission come and say, you can't do that. And if he says, well, I'm told that it's free enterprise, and if it's free enterprise, then can't, oh yes, the minute he says free enterprise, they bow in the direction of the Statue of Liberty and say, oh yes, free enterprise, but not where this is concerned. He tries it again later with a cab service, and that doesn't work. He tries it again later with an electrical utility service, and that doesn't work. Each time, men from the Public Utility Commission come and jump on him. He finally says, well, if we have free enterprise, then how come I can't do any of those things? Just what can I do? And they say, oh, Hey, you can go sell Amway, you asshole. Well, then how come how come you don't want private how come you don't want private enterprise for security? Then? If it's more efficient, cheaper. I I never said I didn't want private enterprise for that. Rand, uh, as I mentioned during my portion of the speak of the speech, she defined uh, government as the monopoly uh, of force in a geographical area and why she, because that is the definition of what a government is, having competing governments would therefore be, uh, and it's not logical because uh, government by its definition is supposed to be a monopoly. And she also, and she, if you're going to have competing governments, it would devolve into, oh, your protection agency, uh, you know, uh, you stole my stuff, so my protection agency is going to go take it back. Well, no, my protection agency is protecting the castle. It'll shoot at yours. So that's why she was against kind of this competing sort of thing. Wait, who's got questions? Anyone else? Yeah, right here. Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Tucker, when your presentation, uh, it sounded like Ayn Rand praised the United States on the other hand, our system is really not pure uh, capitalism. Maybe we got <laughs> Social Security, Medicare. Could you explain that? She, uh, she's, she's admitted that the United States is not purely capitalist, uh, but she recognizes that it was an attempt, the first attempt in history, to subordinate uh, the individual to society, uh, society to the individual. And that's why she has such an affinity for the United States Constitution and the principles of the American founding. She does real she does know that the tendency of government is to grow and to do things uh, you know that it, sh that it probably shouldn't do. And she did lament when that happened. 
So she was she was she was very aware that it, we were not purely capitalist. Any first questions? Any first questions? You? Yes, please. This is a. Can you stand if you don't mind, please? Sorry. Thank you. Um, this is more a question about her life. Do we know where in Chicago she lived when she first? Uh, emigrated to the United States, which yeah. neighborhoods where her American relatives had been living, and what she experienced while she was here before she got to Hollywood. Just had a local history curiosity. Did you hear that? Yeah, uh, she actually came to Chicago first. She lived with some relatives who owned a movie theater. I've never been able to find out what movie theater that was. Uh, all I was able to ascertain is that she was very outspoken. And, and uh, she was a very young girl at the time. I think she was about 22. She uh, uh, was such a nuisance to her relatives. They were glad when she uh, left and went to Hollywood. She still did not speak English very good. And she worked as a soda jerk in, in a Hollywood drugstore while she studied as hard as she could to learn English and then went to work for RKO Studios. About how long was she in Chicago? Uh, I don't think years. she was in Chicago for more than maybe a year or two. Over here, then over there, then we'll go, then over there, then we'll go for seconds. Uh, I live in Chicago, and uh, somebody wants to uh, witness, and I don't like it. Somebody wants to do what? Somebody wants to do a factory. Open a factory? Yeah, and I don't like it. Okay, and people, I, I write up people and say they don't like it. Who had the right to decide that that guy can have business or not? Do you own the property and we're upon the. No, no. I'm, a city, I'm a citizen. So? I'm, I'm a citizen of Chicago. Does. And the other citizen, they don't want him. So the people in the city the don't city. want the factory? Yeah, right. So yeah. what they could either do yeah. is just express their discontent with building a factory, which would probably, or, uh, or they could use force to stop the factory from being uh, built. I think Rand would defer to the property aspect of it. Right to protection. Yeah, she, uh, she would, she'd be, a, if they, you know, she would actually be, for, she'd probably support any sort of progress, including a building of factories. Yeah. So if, if, if the people who, if, if I own this plot of land and I want to build a factory on it, and it's going to bring jobs, and it's going to oh, uh, do whatever. Oh, no, 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 that's not. Ah, yeah. So, 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 if we build a factory, you can I get 100 people every day around him and create a problem? And am I, am I free to do that? Are you free to petition? No, no, free, free to create a problem, free to create a noise. Make it, make it, make it all up. Has it work out? Free, what to, I want to, free do? to physically oppose the factor. You mean yeah. like breaking the windows no, and smashing no, stuff? No, just, just demonstrate, make yeah, a noise. Yeah, of course. You know, as long as you're doing it on private property. Customer, oh, that's you all know, you have to do. You know, the bad thing about it. Can I do that? March around the block. I'm sorry, what was that last portion? Yeah, I can obstruct him to him, so he cannot conduct the tractor. As long as you're not trespassing, I don't see what the... Uh, I don't see why you could And do you think that kind of society can work? I'm sorry? Do you think that kind of society can work? That kind of society will work, where people can break and can physically obstruct... People that have been this one, they are fighting all the time. Yeah, they're free men. <laughs> uh, I think that's kind of how it works now, sort to a degree. Uh, three men want to stop that. that. Did you want to touch on that, Dave? Or? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'd like to, to, in answer to, what is it, Raj? Is that your name? Yes. In answer to Raj's question, one, when Thomas Edison was electrifying New York City, uh, there were many people who were left wingers that were demonstrating against the electrification of New York. They were saying that it would cause cancer, that it would uh, put, uh, it would cause accidents, it would cause all kinds of terrible things. Uh, and Edison had to deal with that as well as all the other things. Uh, eventually, New York City got electrified and it has been better off for it ever since. 
uh, and RAN and our Constitution gives us the right to petition. So if they're going to build a factory and you are against what that factory is going to do, and you have a, a large number of other people who are against it, you can, you have the right to petition. And if enough people sign a petition, you can actually stop that factory from being built. Thank you. How many signatures does that take? Right there with your orange hat. What process is okay. that? I like your personal opinion on something. Uh, I, there's a lot of people who do not like a brand. And I was wondering if you could tell me what you, your thoughts are about the main misconception about her positions. Something that uh, they don't like about her, but that's yeah. wrong. Is, you got that, Dave? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to do it. I can poke at it while you... Misconception. All right, so uh, I think that a lot of the misconceptions come from her idiosyncratic ways of defining things. As, as demonstrated in, in the, uh, the title, Virtue of Selfishness. You know, where certain words have certain associations, so she's wanting to uh, shatter those kind of notions. So I think that's where a lot of the uh, misconceptions come from. She uh, I, I, Most people probably define altruism as meaning helping somebody out. She defined it as sacrificing yourself uh, uh, to, you know, uh, to the po sacrifice yourself to where you don't even think about sustaining your own self. I think she's just. I think part of a lot of the misconceptions come from her how she defines her terms. Okay, I got. You want to you want to go with that one, Dave? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what are some of the mis? What do you think? Are oh yes, misconceptions about Anne Rand. Uh, well, I think to begin with, an awfully lot of people have a misconception about communism and socialism. Uh, I have heard many, many people say to me, not knowing that I know as much as I know about it, that they'll look me right in the face and say, well, in the first place, true communism is really a great thing. Uh, but the communism that has been practiced by Russia or China or Cuba, that's terrible. But true communism is a wonderful thing. Not knowing themselves just what the hell communism is, true communism, watered down communism, uh, filtered communism, or whatever. The, the fact is, that's one reason I think people uh, uh, have a misconception about Ayn Rand. And I, I think they also have a misconception about Ayn Rand because she was rather sexually promiscuous. She was married to a guy named uh, Frank O'Connor. Frank O'Connor, and then she got involved with that guy. Charlie, I see your hand is up. We'll call on you. Uh, hey, he's running the meeting. If you don't mind. What? He's what? All right, come on, Dave. Yeah, not you. Not you. I don't. I do well, mind. Let's the he's let's running the meeting. Uh, Anne Rand had an affair with uh, Nathaniel Brandon. With Nathaniel Brandon. And uh, so she had a few affairs and so forth. So a lot of people may not like Ann Rand for that reason or may have misconceptions about her for that reason. Uh, otherwise, I think that Ann Rand, uh, from what I read about her, and I read an awfully lot of her, all of her books, she was, uh, I think she was right on the money. Okay. She was also had kind of very kinky. Uh, We're going to the second round. <laughs> I'm going to ask what. Got okay, it right here. All right. Since you guys are so hot on Ayn Rand and her governmental philosophy, why do you to consider it ethical of her to receive Social Security and medical care later in life? Ayn Rand was very rich from the books that she wrote. I don't know that she ever received those things. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of that either. Uh, I look I, when I think of that, I like to think of um, in Atlas Shrugged, where the pirate, uh, 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 what I can't think of his name, Ragnar, Ragnar, uh, yes. 
Danaskajold returns to for, uh, to Hank Reardon uh, gold, and this is gold that uh, that Ragnar stole from government uh, relief ships. The reason why he stole it is because it was the stolen income uh, that the looters, the government, had taken from the industrialists. So. I kind of look at it that way. Uh, if she were to be collecting Social Security, I know I would be okay with it because I paid into it and I want to get some of that money back. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, um, right here. Okay. okay. Is there any form of acceptable collectivism for society or for government under the Ayn Rand system? Is there, any, is there any form of acceptable collectivism for the Ayn Rand society, a system? The question is: Is there yes. any is there any form of collectivism that <laughs> would Ayn Rand would endorse? Yes, voluntary. And I also I, I agree with Dave there, and I think collectivism is another one of those words that she defines in a peculiar way, which uh, which which uh, leads to some misconceptions. I mean, it, I think you know I when I wrote the program description for this program, I used the Randian definition of that. I, in my regular use, I will probably be more generous. Like, the College of Complexes is, is a collective. It's not, and it's a voluntary collective. Nobody forces anybody to come here. Okay. In the back. Sorry, sir. Okay. <laughs> in, 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 uh, have you or allowing greater social Benevolent by the state and local versus the federal. Could you repeat that? Did Ayn Rand have views on we is referred to as federalism, where you have a division between a federal government, state, county, and local? Did, did Ayn Rand have an opinion on the federal structure law. of the United States Constitution, <laughs> which right. separates federal and state? Uh, I think that uh, Ayn Rand's attitude would have been that the state can do what it wants as long as they don't interfere with what the federal laws are. And uh, the city can do what they want as long as they don't interfere with what the state laws or the federal laws are, pretty much as it exists now. In my, yeah, in, in my, uh, but the feds are much more proactive now. She would have, she, like I said, she lamented the growth of the state and the, and the usurpation of, of powers. Uh, I want to, to talk about federalism, I mentioned in, uh, in my, in the, my comments on her racism chapter how people use states' rights, uh, as a justification for, for, uh, segregation. Um, I skipped over that portion because I can't cover a whole book in, in, a, in an hour, but uh, she thought that that was a bad re bad reading on the Tenth Amendment. She felt that the Tenth Amendment is there to give, you know, it's not, the Tenth Amendment isn't there so states can infringe on the rights of the people in their states. It's just the Tenth Amendment is there so you know the states have those powers if not delegated to the feds. So she, she recognized that there were some loopholes in the Constitution that allowed for the growth of statism and and she was well aware that people were taking the text and misusing it so I think she would have had a more uh, you know she I think she would have been a true federalist Charlie yeah I and Rand even if you want to All call right. it a philosophy it's certainly different than the other recognized Philosoph uh, uh, philosophers of ethics, such as Jeremy Bentham, who said we should strive for the greatest good for the greatest number. Or Immanuel Kant, who said there's a categorical imperative, I think, that we should go, that we should help the poor and the needy. Do you feel that those guys are wrong? Those kind of concept of no. wanting to do the greatest good for the greatest number is wrong, or that as, we don't have any obligation. That's brought about we do not have any moral obligation to help the poor and needy. Uh, well, first off, I want to comment on uh, you said recognize. I want who's the officiators of recognizing ethics? 
the standard menopause, the subject Okay, of well, that, that's whatever. Jeremy Bentham is in standard. But I, uh, I like uh, the date. John it looks like Stuart it was in standard. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, uh, Charlie, uh, uh, you mentioned Jeremy Bentham yeah, and Emmanuel Kant. Kant, two known uh, left-wingers. <laughs> why, why don't you mention <laughs> Adam Smith <laughs> and... and uh, <laughs> Did I say something funny? Yeah, you told the yeah. joke. They're not left wing Why Adam don't Smith? you mention Adam Smith or John Locke? Okay. They're not uh, philosophers of ethics. So, it was, so your why. question was, uh, That's why. first off, I mean, whoever, who cares what the, how do you determine who's a true philosopher of ethics? But so, so one of your questions was, uh, should we have an obligation? Was yeah, that what it was? To do, uh, a categorical imperative. If people uh, feel that they have an obligation to help the poor, and they feel that it makes them feel good, and that it it's a value in their life, so then the they should no. have no impediments to helping the less fortunate or helping oh. whoever they choose to. It's only if you feel. Wait a minute, right here. Okay, okay. let's. Uh, Please question. All right, we're going to have to go okay. with two more, what and then is, go to rebuttals. Uh, what does okay. Ann Rand think about the issue of pollution, where you know you're. And that affects other people's health or, or potentially other people's property if, if the pollution goes downstream or whatever. I uh, read firsthand, and this is from Ann Rand. She said that it, with respect to pollution, if uh, uh, your house is soiled and made dirty uh, from uh, a nearby factory polluting the area, that your recourse is to sue that family. Uh, pollution is a violation of property rights. It's uh, synonymous with trespassing. And I think that uh, she would recognize it as such. Two more follow-ups and then we're going. Be, would she be for laws um, that would Since the, is, if the if the purpose of the law is to protect property, which pollution laws can arguably do, uh, I guess, I, I can't think of any specific example because I haven't read it, you know. Other than what I guess what Dave said, but I, I, I might have to plead a little bit of ignorance because I don't know everything on what she said on the topic. But I would speculate based on what I know is that she. No, follow, you, you'll get the talk. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other any other questions? For, no, not Charlie. Anyone else? <laughs> because you've had several. Anyone else? So, uh, Sid had, Sid had one. Sid, Sid, and then you, yeah. and then we're out. Why okay. do you think? Uh, somebody like Paul Ryan, who's against Medicare, he's against Social Security, he's against anything that's progressive, would support somebody, and has the philosophy of Ayn Rand. Why would he? What's I guess he likes the way that sh I like Yeah, the way but he's a extremely reactionary. And you said Ayn Rand would, would take things in consideration. But somebody like Paul Ryan and Alan Greenspan fall for philosophy. So what? I'm sorry. What's the question? You know what? You bring that up in your discussion because it's. I don't even see the question. In yeah. The question right over there. All right, Raj. Right. And they support Ann Rand. That's not so a Ann question. Rand is a reactionary. That's not a question either. <laughs> that's that right line. over there. Uh, last, last question. One. Yeah. Stand so, up if you don't mind. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I know that uh, Dave, you're more or less approving of most of Ms. Rand's ideas. Uh, but as Justin had pointed out, she did not get along. She did not play well with others necessarily in the libertarian and conservative and free market intellectual movements. What were, if any, uh, that you care to comment on areas that you found her deficient or there's some other neighboring thinker or idea, you know, from the free market world or the libertarian world that appeals to you more than how she did things. And everyone check your bills to make sure tip was included, because it looks like they weren't on ours. So your question was, who are some other free marketers? Well, what, what do you find? Are there any shortcomings that you find where you think, you know, Friedman did it better, Hayek did it better, Mises did it better, anything like that? Uh, I think uh, my, my I didn't. T it's from in the virtue of selfishness. She she touches this, but I didn't include it in my talk. Yeah. One thing I did not, I do not agree with is the, uh, 
is uh, she said something that a country can be a criminal. And if countries can be criminal, then other countries are justifying and stopping criminal states. Uh, she doesn't really apply a method to, you know, uh, arbitrate that sort of stuff. And it comes across rather hawkish. So I don't think that I would, uh, kind of on that ambiguity, I, I would not support that. Uh, um, I th my only real, uh, compared to others, I guess the only thing you could say is that she wasn't like a, you know, she, did, she didn't have a PhD and she, was, she wasn't a, you know, she didn't go to, you know, U University of Chicago School of Economics or anything like that. But that doesn't, I don't think that that uh, negates her contributions to philosophy okay. or economics. Yeah, uh, I'd like to follow up on that. I'd like to say that uh, Anne Rand, uh, her family having lost everything uh, because of the Russian, of the communist revolution in Russia, and uh, being forced to run away to America, or she would have had her head chopped off uh, because they wanted to get her bad, uh, that she was so full of fervor for liberty and for freedom that she really went crazy to, to put her ideas across. Uh, she alienated a lot of people, made a lot of people very angry at her because of her staunchness. But the fact is, she loved freedom and wanted freedom. Thank you. All right. Okay, that's it for questions. We're getting comments. Abraham, you want to line up here? Or, Abraham. thank you, gentlemen. You can sit down. Let's thank, and thank you, Ed, for moderating again tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Dave. All right, how many want to speak tonight? Raise your hands, please. Sid, we got. If one thing. <laughs> Hold on, Sid. United how many? States was never a free country. All right, we'll go four minutes. The, the Indians were here first, and you time General Philip yeah. Sheridan made a remark, and this remark was not only by uh, uh, the General Sheridan, it was also a big part of the American government. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. And they proceeded to uh, attack the Indians, and, and practice genocide against the Indians. And then they put them on different uh, reservations, and they said, you oh, this will be your home from now on. And after that time, they found excuses to get rid of them, one way or another. If they found oil, or if they found something else under their land, they would get rid of them. Another thing, this country was based on slavery, basically. Like you take cotton and you take tobacco, well, it was grown by slaves. And the slaves weren't paid anything. And I went to Washington, D.C., and I seen the home of uh, President Washington, Mount Vernon. And you see where the slaves live, it was nothing better than a barn with a few straws on the, on the, on the bottom so they could sleep there. So the whole thing was based on slavery and was based on genocide for a lot, to a large degree. And there's a very good writer, his name is Gerald Horn. I just heard him on the radio, but I read his books. And he makes the case, actually, the United States broke away from England, not because of the tax in Boston, the, the tea tax, but because of slavery. Because England wanted to do away with slavery and all our founding fathers held, had slaves, just about all of them. And if you look at the great uh, institutions of learning in the East, like Harvard and uh, the rest of the uh, great institutions, they were all built by slaves. Even the White House was built by slaves. Another thing under capitalism, capitalism is based on slavery. For instance, somebody goes to work maybe eight hours a day, they're not doing that anymore. But anyways, he might work two or three hours, and that's the pay that he gets, and the rest goes to the boss. 
that's a form of slavery. It's not outright slavery, which is worse. It's not feudalism, which is worse, but it's definitely a form of slavery. So when she came here and seen everything was real good, she comes from a middle class background, she's able to make money and so forth, and she participated in the, um, in, in the economy, and she'd done fairly good. So, so that's what it's all based on. It's not based on anything that is objective. All right. Sid, thank you. Four minutes. My, I'm out of power, right? so my apologies. I just ran out of battery power on that. So okay. I think a lot of that criticism of capitalism and property rights in Ayn Rand, I think that's well founded. Um, I'm going to say some good things about Ayn Rand and then some bad things. I agree with Ayn Rand and Justin about things like government violates our rights, denies us freedom, uses force, is basically establishing slavery or involuntary servitude, makes us uh, ask for permission for everything we want to do, and then majorities unfairly decide too many uh, decisions that should be just decided by consenting adults and stuff. Um, the public should not discriminate, but private owners can, and that government should protect uh, life and liberty. I disagree that government should protect property, though. Can you speak a little louder? Sure. Uh, when government protects property, uh, usually government involvement destroys the privacy of property. With uh, warrantless searches by the FBI, property registrations by the recorder of deeds offices, um, eminent domain, they can take our property away from us, so it's not very private when we expect uh, the government to protect it for us. And that is why I think uh, I was kind of disappointed by the answer about whether private security can exist, whether government and the state has to have a monopoly over security. I think when it comes to like, you know, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't pay other countries to manufacture your weapons or your spy equipment because they could compromise you. But when it comes to things like having private security, I'm a private security guard. Uh, my business could operate on a for-profit basis, basis, which it does, or it could operate on a non-for-profit basis. You don't have to have the only, you know, the, the, there can be a private security, maybe even a private jails and prisons, private cops, bounty hunters, stuff that David D. Freeman talks about that they used to do in Iceland a thousand years ago. A uh, totally free market in the provision of security where people are allowed to de protect and defend themselves and uh, turn criminals in who are being looked for, and, you know, they get paid once they turn those people in. We can have a free market in any and every industry that we want to. Uh, you know, David admitted that we can have it in health and transportation, but I say go further. Uh, look into anarcho-capitalism and market anarchism. We can replace the state with private entities, and I think Ayn Rand and a lot of her contemporaries understood that because they believe in the right of contracts so much. And if Ayn Rand really wants to say, I'm against the state, then you have to be thoroughly against everything that it is. Monopoly, violence, territorialism, that's the definition of the state. And I think she agreed that that's the definition of the state, and she, she was against the state, but she didn't really understand what it fully meant to be against the state. And you have to let agencies compete against the state, the state for legitimacy uh, if you want to have a real free market and who provides us with security and justice. Thank you. Very good. So, so I have a question uh, for people. How many people here uh, actually uh, were uh, participants at Bug House Square? Like in the, in the day or not? The, oh, in the day. So there's only one person here. That's, that's Sid Cohen. Uh, Sid, Sid's been doing this. Oh, two people? Okay. And Bob. So Sid uh, let it slip that yesterday was his birthday. He's uh, 92 years old. Wow. So I thought it'd be nice. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sid. Happy birthday to you. And My name is Raj Patel. I was never much into Iron Man or anything like that. Just not my cup of tea. Uh, but uh, my family has been in business for three generations, and I'm a business all my life. 
and uh, we don't go into all these things. Uh, in India, we believe that we are part of the community. Employees are part of the family. And that's why we run the business. And uh, government and society are part of us. You know, in, in America, I like Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker very clearly says that business exists. Let them come first. Business exists to serve the society and by the permission of the society. American corporation was created so that it meets the aspirations of needs of the American people. All the other things you guys are talking about is garbage. Ultimately, it is for the people. Society doesn't exist for a business. Business exists for a society. And that is clear no matter what kind of thing. Even Jesus was clear. You know, he kept the business alive. But he said, hey guys, you got to do this thing, this thing. Okay? Otherwise, he cannot go anywhere. But uh, let's see. I think you go communist society, socialist structure, capitalist structure. Everybody wants their, their people to succeed, their people to be happy. And all they, they do it, and everybody agrees that people have a voice. And now, we, I mean, America, we are finding out that the blacks are getting educated, that Inochic are getting educated, and everybody is speaking out, and they have a voice. And they are going to have a voice. Whether they are poor, or they are rich, or whatever they are. And the thing like Ayn Rand is obsolete. It just no sense. I don't think any sense into the everything, everything talked about here so far. You know, because people do matter. If there are no people, there is nothing. There is no only end and philosophy. There is no business needed. Okay? So, so, so let's get everything right. The people are the reason business exists. And if, if, if you don't believe in that, then you are in the wrong place. And going further, what is happening now? Perhaps the business we are talking, you guys talking about, and we I'm talking about, may not exist. Because now mega corporation like a Amazon, Microsoft, Google, you know, and automation, and things are going to change. So we need to be talking about that because what happens to people? Okay, thank you. Oh, boy, Raj. All right, Raj. Yeah. Here he is. I usually don't give rebuttals because I usually have to be home by 8 o'clock to take the midnight special I've been doing for the last 50 years. But uh, Ayn Rand was a, one of the few philosophers who captured the popular attention. And her books still sell hundreds of thousands. They've sold millions over the years, her novels have. I saw Atlas Shrugged as a movie, part one, with Gary Cooper and the lead. Some rich guy financed it, but he didn't get around it. He didn't have enough money to produce part two. So I don't know how that ended. I'm sure selfishly. Somebody have a pen. Somebody but, got you know, he's a big hero. There's a big hero. I heard him on Phil Donahue, too. Or, sorry, I heard her on Phil Donahue, who works just down the block here at WGM when he did. She's been half the show on seeing how she wasn't going to answer a question, she didn't make out what was phrased. All right, but selfishness, as I said, it, as Anne Rand preached, this is pure egoism, pure greed. Um, she sets out to find good or moral value, and it turns out to be nothing but selfishness. Just, you know, you keep all the money you make unless you want to give it away, and who wants to do that? Not too many. We have some in the U.S. who do it for tax breaks, so. Altruism is much more meaningful. If you're altruistic and you give to others, then you get double the meaning. You get two times the meaning. You make meaning for yourself by helping others, and you help the others, and they get help. So, so altruism is much more meaningful. Um, objectivism, she means referring to reality. Well, what the hell is that? She never does come close to figuring that out. Reality is very complex, and her simplistic treatments don't cut it. She, she tells us such things as, uh, 
Now to initiate force. Well, thanks a lot. Who, who would have the kids starting fights and beating up people and forcing them in any way? Nobody could. Nobody advocates for that. No government on earth would ever do that. I uh, would advocate that. Not, not in recent times, certainly. Um, that's why she's not taken seriously by philosophers. They ignore her stuff. I've been to many philosophy conferences. I've never heard a single talk on Ayn Rand. I never saw one offered, I mean. Yes. She relies too strongly to communism. And she emphasizes freedom way too much. She makes us totally free, but she wants us to be totally free. Um, but, but, but that's just license, you know, just to be greedy. Greedy is good, a Gordon Gecko in Wall Street, the movie. Capitalism, all right, well, the unknown. The unknown, yeah, people don't know what it is. People don't know a lot of things. All they know is how to buy stuff, pretty much. Most people, <laughs> anyhow. Um, that's your greed, that, that, that form of capitalism. Everything for myself again. All for me is good. Hell with everyone else. Hell with the poor people. Hell with the people born poor. I was born poor rich and I can make a lot of money because I had all the advantages from birth. Although there are a few independent geniuses like Ford who make it through there. Um, I got a lot more. To, um, you got like 30 No morals are given. There was no summary of capitalism. The book Capitalism, The Unknown Virtue, that makes it the worst talk I ever heard here. No summary of the book. Not the book, the gold standard. Hello, my name is Adam Wallach. Good to be back. Uh, yes, Ayn Rand had all the advantages of a refugee who was a waitress learning English. Well pointed out, Professor Lichtenberg. Um, but I would say that to both Dave and Charlie. Uh, Dave, I'm going to have to disagree with you about the policy towards refugees today and remind you that Ms. Rand was a refugee from a political oppression back in the 1920s. And that is part of what makes America, for all of its faults, the great place that it is, is that people can flee from worse places and come here. And Central America is in rough enough shape many cases because of U.S. foreign policy, not exclusively. Uh, that, that's why I believe in you know, the free movement of people as well as the free movement of trade. Uh, and Charlie, I'd like to remind you that uh, despite your shouting match with Dave earlier, the Libertarian Party as an organization does completely oppose those policies by President Trump and also promoted today's event, even though we are in fewer in number uh, than the causes that you have belonged to. But you've belonged to so many, so it's hard for me to get around that much. Um, now, if we object to restaurants as some sort of unfair institution, I suppose you could vote with your dollars by electing not to come to these events at restaurants? But that's sort of up to all of you. Um, you know, you do keep deciding to come here week after week, and I come when I can. Uh, because I like attending these events at, uh, at this diner. And if you found another venue, I guess we could try and go there. Uh, you know, it's hard to idealize a notion of being selfless for the sake of being selfless when we take for granted modern productivity. And if we didn't have modern productivity, it would be very hard to pay for idealistic sounding things that have to be generated somehow. And in one of the chapters in Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, which uh, I have here in my hand, they talked about how this is something that's rarely discussed in the Industrial Revolution, uh, when people are criticizing the Industrial Revolution, especially from the left, that there was a massive population explosion between the 18th and 19th century in Britain and in all, over, all over Europe, uh, doubling and tripling almost between the early 1700s and late 1800s. And before that, most people had lived by subsistence farming and died when subsistence farming did not go particularly well. Uh, so even having new jobs for people to perform was something that had to be come up with very quickly. Uh, that doesn't mean it all went well uh, for them or that I'm endorsing everything that happened. But if you don't talk about the population explosion in Europe at that time, you're kind of missing the boat. Uh, thank you, Ed. And, uh, 
Let's see, what else can I cram in here before I run away? Uh, I have not some massive Anne Rand fan. I read the shortest of her four novels in my teens, and again more recently, and I guess I could forgive her a little more because she was learning English when she wrote the novel. It's Anthem, the dystopian one that she narrates. I always found her a little overheated, and I agree to this extent, Professor Lichtenberg, wherever he is, that she is a sort of pop philosopher and not this sort of, you know, sophisticated uh, academic. I think she's uh, evidently, throughout much of her writing and any uh, clips you can find of her audio or video, she's cantankerous, no one else is quite good enough for her. Uh, as Justin said in one of his earlier talks here, I think that your first one here, she hated many people, including her friends. And that shines through her sentence structure and her paragraphs. But I'd like to thank all of you. Sorry if I'm a little disorganized. Uh, thank you. All right, nice. Attaboy, Adam. Well, I'd like to thank the people uh, for discussing these topics. These are ideas that we ought to consider from time to time. But I want to warn you about the dangers of selfishism. You see people, but you only see them outside. You don't see what they're like inside. If you're selfish and you're greedy, they'll come back to you. It's been said about some people that they have nothing but money. They're to be pitied. Because if you are always taking advantage of people, you're not very happy inside, and it will kill you very soon. If you give, and you give generously, it's multiplied back to you. What do you want out of life? If you want the best out of life, you have to give the best out of life. If you try to take everything, you're going to wind up with nothing, and you're going to be miserable. The choice is yours. Okay. Yeah, the choice is yours. So uh, it was it, it was made clear by the speakers that uh, Anne Rand's um, definitions are to diverge slightly from the uh, common definition of some of these words. So um, I, I really didn't pick up clearly on what her definitions of words are, so I'm just going to respond to the general definitions. My apologies if I misconstrued her, uh, her meaning. Um, uh, there are a lot of very famous uh, selfish people. Um, Andrew Carnegie was a selfish person. Uh, um, a Rockefeller, a selfish person. The Koch brothers are selfish people. Uh, there are a tremendous number of selfish people, and you can, and that's represented by the amount of money in their pockets. Uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of, of wealth uh, inequality in the United States and in the world. I think in the world, one percent of the uh, one, or what is it, uh, fifty percent of the population in the world uh, have one percent of the assets. In the U.S., uh, it's. Um, top 1% is about a third of the U.S. assets. I mean, it's really just uh, really lopsided. The, the problem as I see it is, is uh, and, and this speaks to some of, the discuss, or some of the mentions of capitalism, it's like capitalism is good. Well, it really depends on what kind of capitalism you're talking about. Um, you're talking about uh, capitalism in uh, Germany or capitalism in the United States or the capitalism that's practiced in uh, Nepal or China. They all have different ideas of what capitalism is. Um, I, I think the main problem is something that's called economies of scale. Is that uh, it, it's just not doesn't seem to me that it's taken into account when you're setting up public policy related to uh, regulating uh, uh, corporations and capitalism. The more powerful you are, the easier it is for you to get what you want and do what you want. You drive down your costs, it's harder for the little guy to compete. And, and this really doesn't seem to, to be addressed by, uh, by our government, but unfortunately our, the capitalists have a big say in those policies. I, I see, you know, they, 
if, if there's a new Walmart that's put up, he, there's a celebration out front. But it's like, well, how many little businesses are you putting out of business to start that Walmart? And what do the people get paid in that Walmart? Is that really fairness? Is that really letting the system work? It, it seems to me that with capitalism, you have to have controls because selfishness and capitalism by itself is going to mean that uh, by the end of the, in, in 50 or 20 years, we're going to be looking at like principalities again, except the principalities be economic principalities run by a very few. It's, we're already headed that way. It's really, it's really a shame. So that's my general feedback. Uh, I have one last complaint. Uh, Charlie is just uh, this provocateur who is always trying to shake things up. He has the audacity to come in here and complain about Ayn Rand when he's wearing an Ayn Rand t-shirt. That's just <laughs> terrible. Not Ayn Rand. This is the guy from Kentucky. Is there anyone else who's a provocateur of the left? Charlie, this next well, comment is directed at you. Oh, yeah? You well, told me on, that Bill. Adam Smith was not a philosopher. No, he's not. Well, Anybody who wrote a book economist. called The Theory of Moral Sentiments <laughs> no, 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 is no. a philosopher. No, no, no. He wrote not only The Theory of Moral <laughs> Sentiments, but he then went on to produce The Wealth of Nations, which is what our system is based upon. And unlike Ayn Rand, he did support taxation for public goods, such things as even a free education for the education for the children of the area and other such public good. What you don't quite understand, though, as I've read, I, I wouldn't say I read, but I listened to the book Atlas Shrugged uh, when you know, through the car, and it took me almost three weeks to get through because I have a lot of problems with Anne Rand's philosophy. She was selfish to the point where it's been a verified and documented fact that when she actually needed government help, she went and she got it like any of us else would. She have it, you know, she was so overburdened and people should be this way, but when she was having uh, leukemia and cancer, the later stages of her life, she went and got government help for her medical expenses. And she did collect Social Security. I just verified it when I went on the, the, some of the other websites that are fact checkers, and she did. I have also happened to have a friend of mine who a long time ago advocated that he should not pay income tax or anything else, so he went into an all-cash business, and uh, he was uh, very, very, very uh, obnoxious about government and espousing and rent philosophy. Well, he went and he got turned about 65, and all of a sudden he had some medical issues. And he too went on to collect Social Security and go on Medicare. So basically, you know, if you're going to really think about this, government does have more functions than just preventing force. There is an element of self-preservation, an element of collective goods like roads, bridges, and yes, even some form of unemployment insurance and other types of things, and a responsibility to help curtail the power of some of our major corporations through the Antitrust Act. I don't think I like to say this, but you know, generally I'm more for capitalism and free enterprise than not because I still think it works out a lot better. But at the same time, there has to be some form of countervailing power. And with us, it's the court system and uh, some of the things that some of these uh, corporations do are a little bit off the scale. I've seen it before and, uh, you know, but the best countervailing power I've seen to a lot of corporations, especially larger internet companies, is the customers. They want what they do and if they don't patronize them, they're fast out of business. Anyway, thank you very much. I still think the best philosopher though, 
currently is Johan Norberg out of Sweden. Yeah. And a boy, Tim. All right. Let's thank <laughs> both our speakers for a nice presentation. Thank you guys very much for going to get together here. I'll be eclectic as usual here. You know, in the in the uh, city of Chicago, state of Illinois, uh, in part of the curriculum of all schools, elementary schools, uh, children under the sixth grade, was uh, they had to study civics. Yeah. And I studied, I remember this, because it's my first introduction to government, and they had to study something called the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. So we're going to study the Constitution. I suggest that uh, the people here tonight, and particularly the members of the Libertarian Party, take a look at the Constitution, the preamble, and what it says. And that gives you to promote the general welfare, and da 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 da. And that defines and is, remains in effect today. And that's the function that the government should fulfill. And I learned tonight that the libertarian position on any particular issue depends on who you talk to in the libertarian party. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is not surprising, but it's probably the same in any other political party. But government does have a mandate of heaven, the Chinese say, to assist the people and those in the, the people in, in, in situations of need. Now, sadly to say, I really don't know if we, a libertarian president, if there were a natural disaster and there were people in need, people of hunger and homeless <coughs> and in need of medical attention would say, well, uh, there's nothing I can do. Uh, maybe somebody, hopefully somebody will help you. But uh, it's not within my inclination to do anything using the apparatus of the government of the United States at the federal, state, and local level to assist you people in need, a genuine need of which uh, you need assistance. And any government that fails to do that, I don't know what purpose that organization has for existing if it does not benefit the people who belong to it and contribute to it and fight for that country. And that country doesn't come back and, earn, and help them? That's ridiculous. Now, I looked here and a little note. I see I got another copy of the, the uh, Libertarian Party platform. By the way, all of Ayn Rand is is shock value. She's like this Ann Coulter or this comedian woman that the more outlandish you can be, you know, <laughs> I don't know if she contributes anything to the political conversation. And Ayn Rand is probably a little more, so she's a little swifter than, than the ones floating around today. But I looked at the platform, and one of the things, okay, nothing's perfect. It's your first time around. Hey, you guys got a nice draft got going. But take a look at your platform. There are very significant problems in the United States. We are not a perfect society. And what must be done collectively, use your intelligence. All programs might win or lose, it's success and failure. But what must be done to improve the conditions? Like here I say, what is the purpose of a union? I say to improve the conditions of employment. What's the purpose of a government? to improve the life and the conditions of the people who live within that country. If it doesn't do that, what's it for? Not the status quo. Everything is not perfect. What? That's what I mean. Looking at the platform, I go, oh, where country is this? Everything is cool. It's not the United States. Anyhow, thanks a lot. Let's work on the next one. Yay! Yay. Boy, yeah, I let you guys off easy. Is you know, there anyone else who needs to talk? Thank you, Commissioner. I'll let you off easy. All right, the speakers are next. Hey. Won't happen next time. I just want to—I want to thank everybody for coming out. I had a really good time. It was a very interesting discussion. Uh, the only thing I want to rebut uh, specifically, uh, and I skipped over this chapter in the virtue of selfishness for time, the ethics of emergencies. She does think that in emergencies. 
you should be able to help people if you can help them, uh, because emergencies are not uh, situations uh, that are supposed to be over long periods of time and are for, you know, short and devastating in that short period of time. She didn't feel it was okay to, uh, A little help. to help those. A little as long as you're not going to jump in the fire and kill yourself, uh, she thought it was okay. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean you should go to every single fire and risk your life to go save everybody else. Oh, who cares? But uh, that's basically all I wanted to rebut. Thanks, guys, and uh, I'll see you at my Milton Friedman talk in a couple of months. All right. Dave, did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to take issue with this concept about greed is good. Uh, the fact is, <clears throat> greed is good. It's very good. Now you can laugh and shuffle and all of that, but I can prove to you that greed is good. Yeah. I'm not saying that avarice is good, and I'm not saying that greed with and coupled with criminality is good, but greed itself is good. And I'll quote you the story of a man that uh, owned a glove factory and uh, made himself a half a million dollars a year in his glove factory. And he was greedy for more. And he paid his employees an above average wage. And he gave them good working conditions. But he decided to buy the slum property that was next door, have it torn down, and build another wing on his building, and produce ladies' gloves, and that he could make another half a million dollars a year there, employ another 65 people, and give them all good working conditions. Now, I cannot see for the life of me where that kind of greed is bad at all. Uh, I also want to take issue with one other thing. The gentleman here in the orange cap, uh, he yeah. said something about Andrew Carnegie and that Andrew Carnegie was uh, very selfish and so on. I want to point out that it is an absolute known fact that Andrew Carnegie gave away everything he had before he died. Uh, uh, jumping on to that, uh, one of the biggest, uh, if you watch PBS, one of your the biggest, uh, you know, underwriters to PBS is yeah, David and Charles yeah. Koch. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, uh, greed. Uh, socialism is a uh, is a system based entirely on greed. It's a system of taking something that's not yours. And because you don't have it, you want it. That's you know, that's that's that is uh, the real system of greed. That's all I gotta say. Thank you. All right. Why don't you go ahead and adjourn us? Thank you again for moderating. We really appreciate so it. So today's uh, meeting is over. We're going to Honey Bear out of this. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much, young man. <laughs>